The apparent ease with which Saddam's forces were so completely overwhelmed during the 44 days of the Gulf War raises important questions about how future wars will be fought and what kinds of weapons will be used. This program examines the technologies which seem to have played such a key role in Saddam's military defeat. A defeat which he now proclaims to have been a political victory. But back in January, as the pilots and ground crew of the 37th Tactical Fighter Wing prepared for a war that had become inevitable, there was no time to indulge in abstract considerations of victory or defeat. Within a few hours, this pilot would be dropping bombs in the heart of the most heavily defended city in the world, Baghdad. Hardly an attractive proposition, particularly in an aircraft which has no guns and no radar. But this pilot would be protected by a technology which no other aircraft in the Gulf could match, stealth. The F-117A stealth fighters are known as the Black Jets and are said to be undetectable by radar or infrared sensors. Coated in radar absorbent material, the Black Jet's skin will soak up a significant proportion of any energy directed at it, while its unconventional shape deflects the remaining radar beams away from the interrogating source. It's said that this 66-foot-long plane has the same radar signature as a .22 air rifle pellet or a small bird. Flying undetected and unchallenged on that first moonless night of the war, the only other plane the black jet would see was the one from which it would refuel shortly before entering Iraqi airspace. The time was now 2.35 on the morning of January 17th, and 600 miles away in the Gulf, the first shot of the war was about to be fired. Symbolically, for the war that was to come, it was a high-tech unmanned cruise missile. By 2.45, all hell had broken loose across the length and breadth of Iraq. Over Baghdad itself, surface-to-air missiles, or SAMs, and anti-aircraft artillery, known to the pilots as AAA, pierced the night sky in a frantic attempt to halt the invisible intruders. Well, I had never seen AAA before, and I had never seen SAMs launch before. And then the first night, I saw both. And it looked to me, I describe it, uh, Disneyland is famous for their fireworks displays, and it's pretty awesome. And it looked like we were going to be flying right through the middle of that fireworks display. The first few missions were pretty scary. Uh, um, everyone was nervous. Uh, no one expected us to achieve the results that we did without getting hit at all. I think everybody was um, well pleased with the success of the uh, stealth fighter, the 117. Uh, it did all that was expected and hoped of it. it. It went in, as far as we know, unseen and came out unseen. Um, the very early waves were targeted against the Iraqi communication system for obvious reasons. Now, the fact that he stopped broadcasting at the precise time on target of the first wave was a reasonable indication that that wave had been successful. Within the first 10 minutes of the war, there had been uh, attacks on the telephone system, on the electric system, on all of the sector operation centers, the, uh, the national air defense operation centers, the associated intercept operation centers, uh, on significant command posts at, at strategic and operational levels. This happens across the entire breadth of the country and it happens for practical purposes simultaneously. Once we had made the first attack, he was doomed because we had imposed strategic paralysis from which he could not recover. Even as the dust was settling from the first of what were to be many bombing raids that night, the awful truth of Colonel Warden's observation must have been dawning on the Iraqi high command. The war was only 10 minutes old, and already they were deaf, dumb, and blind, thanks largely to a handful of unseen stealth fighters. 
To those who had been planning for this night since the previous October, stealth technology had finally and dramatically proved its point. What stealth allows you to do is, is it obviates the need for large force packaging that you need to do with conventional aircraft assets. You don't need all uh, uh, the suppression of enemy air defenses aircraft, or what we call seed aircraft, to go along with stealth. You don't need the, the force protection aircraft or the air-to-air -air fighters to go along with stealth to protect them. Uh, and what that allows you to do is free up a whole series of assets uh, to strike a, a wide array of tar a targets simultaneously. Uh, and if I may uh, use an example to describe what I'm talking about. Uh, early on, uh, we had a conventional attack package consisting of uh, four Saudi tornadoes, four A6s. And since it was relatively early on in the conflict, we had four F4Gs designed to suppress enemy air defenses. We had uh, five EA-6B uh, electronic combat jamming aircraft and 21 FNA-18s carrying harms, uh, high-speed anti-radiation missiles to take out surface air missile sites. Uh, so a total of 38 aircraft okay, to get four bomb droppers across one target. At the same time, we had 21 F-117s attacking 38 targets, okay? So that's what the value of stealth is. It allows you to reach out and, and, and accomplish much more uh, than if you only had conventional aircraft. Daybreak revealed the appalling scale of the damage that had been accomplished on that first fearsome night. But still the barrage continued. From the warm, clear waters of the Red Sea, 800 miles away, cruise missiles launched from submarines began their one-way trip to Baghdad. More of the $1.2 million missiles were taken to the air from battleships stationed in the Persian Gulf. Navigating by radar along a carefully pre-programmed route, the missile is constantly checking the terrain over which it's flying looking for rivers and roads, bridges and hills. It's been said that if a cruise missile were fired at the Houses of Parliament from the middle of the Mediterranean, it would be capable of selecting which window to enter as it neared Westminster Bridge. It's that accurate. There he goes. By day, cruise missiles were the only aircraft ever to fly in the hostile skies over Baghdad, since even a stealthy black jet can of course be seen. Instead, the coalition's air force's daylight missions concentrated on the Iraqi positions in Kuwait and near the Saudi border. It's been estimated that around $300 million worth of bullets, bombs and missiles were used during the first 24 hours of the war. As dusk fell on that first day and the ground attack aircraft returned, the night attack aircraft were being prepared for their second trip north into Iraq. Already, this was becoming a 24-hour night and day war. Some guys never even saw daylight. You would get up when it was just starting to get dark, you'd go in a flight plan, you'd fly when it was dark, then you'd probably land about this time the sun was coming up and it was time to go to bed. So based on whatever wave you were, we basically lived at night while we were at war. While Captain McKelvey and his weapons officer, Captain Chance, were being briefed for their second mission over Iraq, the 25-year-old aircraft they would be flying that night was receiving the last few hundred gallons of its standard 4,000-gallon fuel load. It was also being armed with the kinds of bombs which would become a feature of the next 42 days of the war. These are precision-guided munitions or as the press soon learned to call them, smart bombs. A smart bomb is simply a conventional bomb with a laser-seeking sensor, a simple guidance mechanism, and steering fins on its nose. At around $80,000 each, 
These bombs are four times more expensive than a conventional bomb, but are over a hundred times more accurate. Why? Well, a dumb bomb, as conventional weapons are traditionally called, will fall along a parabolic trajectory, the mathematics of which would have been unremarkable even to Sir Isaac Newton. It's the result of a combination of forces, gravity, wind resistance, and the forward motion of the plane. In practice, however, as dumb bombs fall towards their target, winds and air currents, aerodynamics, and structural asymmetries will cause them to deviate from their mathematically ideal path. For a group of dumb bombs dropped from 10,000 feet, for example, this means that over half of them will miss the aiming point by over an eighth of a mile. This missed distance creates a lethal area around the intended aiming point, known as the circular error probability. And for the high altitude bombers of World War II, that meant the bombs could fall as much as a mile from their targets. If you think back to World War II as an example, you recall that the circular error probable of B-17s was in the vicinity of about 3,300 feet. This meant that in order to have a high probability of hitting a relatively small target, like uh, the size of, a, of an aircraft shelter, about 60 by 100 feet, that you needed to drop almost 9,000 bombs. To drop 9,000 bombs, you would need almost 1,000 B-17s. Nowadays, no Air Force in the world could afford to mount a 1,000 bomber raid aimed at a single target. The cost of the aircraft, the cost of the bombs, and of course the cost in lives, both aircrew and innocent civilians, collaterals as they become known, were simply too high. So during the final months of the Vietnam War, secret tests were conducted with the new laser-guided bombs. Since then, smart bombs have evolved towards a measure of accuracy that is chillingly precise. It's now not a matter of which building you want to hit, but whether you wish the bomb to enter through the door or the window. This devastating accuracy is achieved by illuminating the target with coded pulses of invisible infrared laser light. The target then becomes a sort of laser lighthouse, reflecting that energy back into the sky. Like a ball bearing tossed into a plastic funnel, a bomb tuned to that coded laser light will always steer towards the reflection. When it was first developed all those years ago, this system was top secret and was codenamed PAVETAC. Captain Mark Chance describes a typical PAVETAC bomb run. Basically, once Mike and I have gotten into the target area, I've already gotten the radar picture of what the target is looking like. Hmm. The PAVETAC pod, our infrared detector set, is looking the same spot that the radar is. Paint all the way out to 12. Looking good on the target. 180 looks good for the egress heading. The laser is now looking at the target and giving us information back telling us exactly how far we are out from the target. Mike is then given good information on where he needs to put the airplane to get the best chance of bomb seeing the target. Three seconds to pull. Okay, watch for the bar. Video switching, pulling, and pickling. Roger. He's 10 miles. I video switched so that now I am looking at what the paved tack pod is looking at, which hopefully is still on the target. So I'm not actually flying the bomb, I'm flying a spot on the ground and telling the bomb this is the point where I want it to hit. The bomb then determines the best way for it to get there. Laser's on. Tracking. Yeah! The precision allows you to, to destroy exactly what you want to destroy with a minimum of collateral damage, with a, with a minimum of loss of, of, of innocent civilian life, and to do it with, with very few airplanes. Throughout that second night, as the raids continued unabated, increasingly bizarre images were being recorded. Some smart bombs have cameras in their noses and are flown to the target by the air crew using a joystick control, rather similar to those used in video games. A bomb's eye view of the Gulf War. At three minutes past two that morning, however, the world was treated to a chilling demonstration of the value of imprecision. Eight Scud ballistic missiles struck Israel. 
Incredibly, no one was killed, although 68 people were injured. The 40-year-old missile had caused less physical damage than an average-sized dumb bomb. And yet the echo from this Scud's impact was to reverberate around the world. The whole military machine had thought of the Scud as a not very accurate threat and therefore one not to be taken very seriously. This was because when targeted against something like a barracks or an airfield, the chances of it hitting anything of any significance were fairly low. Uh, whereas in fact what had been forgotten, I think, by most of the military uh, planners was that if it was targeted against a city, wherever it fell, it would cause quite significant damage, and that that would be politically pressurizing on the government involved. Which had been precisely the objective behind the use of such an imprecise weapon as the Scud. While their Knesset deliberated on how to respond to these random attacks, Israeli civilians strove to maintain some sort of normal daily life, despite the gas masks they were all now forced to carry. The unanswered question in everyone's mind was whether the rather modest amounts of explosive that the inaccurate Scud carried would be replaced with a chemical warhead. To this day, intelligence sources are divided about whether Saddam's engineers were able to fit their chemical warheads to the longer-range Scuds. But what was well known in those early days of the war was that Saddam not only possessed chemical weapons, but that he would use them too as he had three years earlier on the Kurdish village of Halabja. For months, the troops had been practicing what's known as the NBC drill. NBC standing for nuclear, biological, and chemical warfare. The appalling reality underlying this awkward palaver is that you may have as little as nine seconds in which to protect yourself after a chemical attack before dying of convulsions, asphyxiation, and heart failure. It was clear that the Scuds had to be stopped, whether they could carry chemical weapons or not. It was hoped that the answer would lie in the Patriot anti-missile missile, and units were rushed to sites throughout the Gulf. Over the next few weeks of the war, the highly publicized Patriot came to be perceived as yet another example of the West's technological supremacy, along with laser-guided bombs, cruise missiles, and the stealth fighter. Once again, TV audiences were invited to marvel at the ability of technology to frustrate Iraqi aggression. Unaware that an extraordinarily difficult technical problem lies behind this new type of Gulf War fireworks display. Tech will continue on Discovery Showcase. Once the elements united and a world was born. Witness a baffling evolution, the making of a cotton. Wednesday at 8 Eastern and Pacific only on the Discovery Channel. Yep, it's a dull, boring morning. 65 degrees. No wind. No clouds. your dog today. Give them new Butcher's Choice biscuits from Milkbone. A choice of beef, bacon, liver, and chicken in every box. Basted with rich, meaty juices. Gimme, 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 gimme what I cry for. You know you made me. New Butcher's Choice biscuits from Milkbone. 
Pain like this could mean you have sensitive teeth. Here's a remarkable solution. Introducing Aquafresh Sensitive. It targets the cause of the pain. Microscopic holes that let hot and cold shoot straight to the nerve. Aquafresh Sensitive soothes the nerve and helps stop the pain. And with fluoride and that great Aquafresh taste, it can replace your everyday toothpaste. So you may never have sensitive teeth pain again. New Aquafresh Sensitive. Soothes the nerve. Helps stop the pain. If you and your checking account could use a change of scene, come on over to Wells Fargo Bank. Enjoy longer hours, five-minute max teller service, 24-hour person-to-person phone service, and a Wells Fargo stagecoach check that's a change of scene all by itself. Move all your accounts to Wells Fargo today. The change of scene will do you good. Wells Fargo Bank, a better brand of service. If winter has you down, turn up the heat. Escape to Paradise, beginning Friday at 10 Eastern and Pacific, only on the Discovery Channel. The University of Wisconsin Green Bay Women's Cage Club invites you to experience Lady Phoenix basketball. Support the Phoenix women in their 20th season, the first as members of the Mid-Continent Conference. The Phoenix women are ready to power their way to the top of the Mid-Continent. Don't miss any of the action. Call 465-2145 for ticket information and support the Lady Phoenix. At last, a worry-free vacation with Hiddle Tours. Hiddle Tours specializes in arranging group travel via motor coaches as well as cruises and air travel. Look to Hiddle Tours for business incentive travel, senior citizen groups, sporting events, bank travel clubs, and more. Spring into golf with Hiddle Tours in Nashville, Tennessee, March 21st to the 27th. Golf with us at the finest courses in Tennessee. Call Hiddle Tours today for reservations at 1-800-666-2260. Spy Tech now continues on Discovery Showcase. At launch, a long-range Iraqi Scud, known as an Al Hussein, weighs a little over five tons, most of which is highly explosive liquid propellant. It will reach a height of over 150 kilometers before falling back to the Earth and into the sights of the waiting Patriot battery. The Patriot's radar will now begin to pay particular attention to this new object in the sky, and high-speed computers will calculate its trajectory, velocity, and potential impact point. While the Scud is still over 35 kilometers away, the Patriot missiles will be automatically launched, and that, says the textbook, is that. But the textbooks were wrong. Conventional wisdom on the uh, Rocky Scud was that it was a very simple target, that it would be very large, that it would be very slow, that it would be very easy to hit uh, a very easy target. That turned out to be exactly wrong. Uh, nothing could have been further from the truth. The Iraqi Scuds had been modified from the original Soviet design in order to reach Tehran during the mid-80s. But increasing the range of a ballistic missile also increases the speed at which it travels. So intercepting an Al Hussein is a whole new ball game. I think one way to think of the timing of these intercepts is to think of, uh, of a goalie in a football game who has to deal with a penalty shot. And the penalty shot is fired at very high speed at the goal. And the goalie can only move at a moderately high speed. And so it's a real foot race to get to the ball to intercept it before it goes through the goal. And in this particular penalty shot, how fast are the missiles approaching each other? About 9,000 miles per hour. Now, as if the task of intercepting a ballistic missile traveling at 5,000 miles per hour with an anti-missile missile traveling at 4,000 miles per hour wasn't tricky enough, the long-range Iraqi Scud posed another totally unexpected problem. If the Scud re-entered the Earth's atmosphere at an angle, which it often seems to have done, the unequal aerodynamic forces on the lengthened missile would cause it to break up. This produced some seriously expensive headaches for the Patriot engineers. And on the first night in which they were used in Tel Aviv, no fewer than 28 Patriot missiles, $17 million worth, were launched at the debris from just five old scuds, which had broken up into separate pieces.
We learned later that they had broken up, but we didn't know that at the time. When they came into Patriot's radar surveillance, a number of tracks were seen on the screen. These were solid tracks, uh, and the operators engaged those uh, just like they would any track. When it was learned that the scuds were in fact breaking up, then the operators uh, very quickly learned to be able to distinguish between the warhead and the other parts, the tanks, etc., such that uh, very quickly after that they then engaged only the warheads and did not waste missiles engaging uh, tanks and other debris that uh, had broken off from the scud. But even though the mere presence of the Patriots seemed to defuse the threat of Israeli retaliation, it was clear that their patience would not be limitless. Although the permanent Scud launch sites had been destroyed early on in the war, it was the mobile Scud launchers which were still causing trouble. A couple of 23-year-old Boeing 707 cargo planes turned out to have the answer. In December of last year, these two venerable old aircraft, known as Joint Stars, were still in the middle of development testing and were officially two years away from delivery to the U.S. Air Force. But the war was to change all that. On January 11th of this year, the two aircraft, the aircrew, and even a few of the subcontractor civilian technicians took off for the Gulf. The cause of this unseemly and unusual haste lay in what joint stars can do. The clue is in the name. STARS is an acronym for Surveillance Target Attack Radar System. It is claimed that Joint STARS can see hundreds of miles into enemy territory and see troop movements and individual vehicles, tanks, armored personnel carriers, and of course, SCUDs. Quite frankly, uh, before we uh, deployed to, uh, to the Mideast, uh, SCUD was really not even part of our vernacular. You know, we were pretty well focused on looking for uh, armored mechanized vehicles. Uh, when we arrived in theater and, and after the air war started and SCUDs became a, an issue in the war, uh, we were asked to see if we could contribute toward uh, finding and, and ultimately destroying those missiles. We're starting to have a target developed right here in this particular area. I think I ought to call the ace to take a look at it. Hey. What y'all got here? Take a look right here. The display that the operator has uh, is really a map, electronically generated map of the area that he's looking at. It has roadways on it. It has borders on it, has lakes, foliage, that sorts of thing. Overlaid onto that are uh, a series of little yellow dots, and each one of those dots is something that's moving. Anything that's moving, it'll come back as a little dot to the operator. Uh, what we're able to do then is to uh, put a bunch of these little dots together over time and make almost like a little cartoon strip uh, of the little dots in animation actually moving. Uh, in the early phases of any mission, uh, the target tier is trying to assess what is going on really in his area of responsibility. So he'll sit, sit and look for, uh, say, 20 or 30 minutes at the, the patterns of movements of all these little dots. And he will try to decide whether those dot movements are make any sense. Is it an organized movement, for instance? Is it something that's indicative of a column of vehicles on the move? Is it just random movement? Maybe uh, some civilian traffic out there. Uh, if he doesn't see a column, a major organized movement on the way, he will sit and analyze the data and try to see if uh, any of the movement is uh, going toward a specific place and stopping. Uh, if he detects that, we'll take a synthetic aperture radar picture, one of these radar snapshots, if you will, and see what has stopped. Uh, we were very successful at that in the war in that we were able to cue ourselves through the moving vehicle mode of the radar to areas where uh, the Iraqis were actually building up uh, assembly areas and due to the array of the vehicles how they were setting up we were able to determine through our imagery analyzers uh, that indeed those were scud launchers that were setting up and we were able to uh, direct fighters into those launch areas and in several cases uh, interdict uh, scud sites before launches occurred have you been able to get a target count the success of joint star scud hunting experiences has triggered further avenues of research but during the war it was Joint Star's links with the ground which made it unique. One of its principal features is that the surveillance imagery which it presents to the airborne crew is simultaneously relayed to an army ground unit. During the clash of American and Iraqi ground forces at al kafji early on in the war, this proved decisively useful. Joint STARS operators spotted a convoy of Iraqi armored reinforcements moving down the road from Al-Wafra towards the battle. 
They were a little less than a day away. This was high priority information requiring immediate action. What's known as perishable intelligence. If the intelligence in a near real time system is not used within a reasonable amount of time, it essentially can become null and void. So if you see a convoy, let's say at 2200 hours, and it is reported and maybe not acted upon for four hours, that convoy more than likely is no longer there. Therefore, it is incumbent upon the people who use the system, the people who uh, interpret the, the imagery, to get the information out as fast as possible. And then if, if it is decided by the user that it's a real target, to try to act on it in a reasonable amount of time. The column of Iraqi reinforcements never made it to al Kafji. Tech will continue on Discovery Showcase. This portion of the Discovery Channel is sponsored in part by Pepto Bismol. It always happens at the worst time. A sudden attack of diarrhea. And you give anything to get back in control. Introducing Pepto Diarrhea Control. It's made with the strongest diarrhea medicine you can buy. So it often stops diarrhea the first time you take it. Nothing works better than this. And this is from Pepto-Bismol. Take control with new Pepto-Diarrhea Control. In the early 90s, the real estate business changed. I've got your financing seminar, two closings, and a showing. Busy day. Busy morning. Professionals took control, trained to use the latest marketing tools, responsive to the real human issues. He's not moving, but we've got a meeting set for tomorrow. And one organization is setting the pace. Better Homes and Gardens Real Estate. Join us. Call 1-800-ADVANCE. Do you know what you need to know about managing your money? Take the Wall Street Journal personal finance test and find out. Are you wasting money by buying a car rather than leasing it? Are there drawbacks to refinancing a loan at a lower rate? When can you throw away old tax returns? You'll find the answers in this free book, The Wall Street Journal Guide to Understanding Personal Finance. The guide is filled with information, from financing your new car to refinancing your home. There's even information on how to lower your taxes. It's yours free when you subscribe to The Wall Street Journal. Every business day, the Wall Street Journal gives you the news, analysis, and insights you need to make the right decisions for your business, your career, your future. Subscribe now to the Wall Street Journal. Get 13 weeks of the journal for $37, over 20% off the newsstand price, and your free copy of the Guide to Personal Finance. Call 800-523-9800. That's 800-523-9800. Does it feel like things are too much to handle? Like your life is just a lot of pain? Call the Boys Town National Hotline. They've helped hundreds of thousands of kids and parents. They know what to do to help you. Call toll free, 1-800-448-3000. Once, the elements united. Fire forged the earth. As mountains jolted upward, water nourished the land, and life began to grow. This is the story of the birth of our world, the evolution of animals who inhabit it, and the colossal forces still at work today. Witness the making of a continent, Wednesday at 8 Eastern and Pacific, only on the Discovery Channel. If winter has you down, turn up the heat. Soak up the sun and enjoy the sights. Escape to Paradise, beginning Friday at 10 Eastern and Pacific, only on the Discovery Channel. Spy Tech now continues on Discovery Showcase. Week three of Operation Desert Storm and the Allies had virtual freedom of the skies. 24 hours a day and at all altitudes. The Central Commanders in Riyadh decided to take advantage of this unexpected situation and increase the number of bombing raids over Iraq. Rather as they had with Joint Stars, 
they called in another technology, which officially at least was still in development, TIAL. TIAL is a laser targeting system which is fitted to the tornadoes of number 617 squadron, the Dam Busters. I can just see a vertical wall at the end of this, Bill. Yeah, that's right. It's supposedly the one that opens. Oh, no, it's right. Right, here it goes. Yeah, yeah right in the one. Thank God for that. I hope that's a great one. Gotten the map, one of these is a dead stop. Wow, well, we can always plug the heaters in go at the top. Okie dokie. Yeah, that was a box canyon, that one. Yeah, I wonder whether it was the other one. Okay. Oh no, we can go left. Can you? Is a route through there, yeah. I don't think there is. No, we're off it, Bill. We're off it. Yeah, you're right. Uh. TIAL is said to represent the very latest thing in smart electro-optical precision guidance systems and is manufactured in a converted biscuit factory up in Edinburgh Back Street. But this is far from Back Street technology. Working in clean room conditions in which even the air is filtered to remove particles of dust which might interfere with the sensitive optical systems, TL is assembled with surgical precision. A TV camera, a high-powered laser, a few hundred microchips, and a thermal imager are all crammed into the confined space of a 10-foot-long pod, which can be bolted to the belly of an aircraft. Unlike the earlier generations of airborne laser designators used on the American F-111s, TL locks the laser beam automatically onto the target, even if the aircraft is maneuvering to avoid enemy fighters, surface-to-air missiles, or, as was most often the case over Iraq, Triple A. OK, I've got some Triple A coming up from the target area for. Hey, RH WR for clear. Looking ahead, lowest concentration looks like it'll be coming right, one, two, zero, off target. OK, you back me up with some chaff. Yeah, 18 miles to run. OK. Switch is coming. Live. Late arm is Late, late arm was gone. OK, timing's running down. The mark's good. 11 miles to run. 35 seconds. I think it's going to have to work. Yeah. Good mark. 30 seconds. Next. Only five seconds. Looking good. Waiting. Norwich 2, happy. Go on. Nothing on the RHWR. Thanks, Paul. Okay. Okay. Now I've committed, which is good. Norwich 01, stand by. Committed in the back. 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Norwich 01, stores away. All right. Chaff, please. Okay. Chaff's going out. It's dispensing. Camp time. 20 seconds. Check over for it. Rose is firing. Roger. Rose is firing. Tracking the doors. 30 seconds to go. 30 seconds. And five, four, three. Bombs gone. Right. LFR, ground staff, field of view, roger. Slashing across. And we're virtually right over the top. OK, field of view and tracking. Right, 15 seconds. Nicely. There's no way this air crew could have known whether there were any people in the hardened aircraft shelter they've just bombed, or whether there are any in this one either. There'd be nothing they could do about it if they did know. The bomb's already falling and the laser is locked onto the target. The conclusion is inevitable. Five, four, three, Picture clear. Two, one. Yeah, splash. Yeah, splash. By the middle of February, at least as far as this war was concerned, the Iraqi Air Force was finished. The ground war had to be imminent, and traditionally that means that it's time to enlist the services of the long-range heavy artillery. Enter stage left, 3-9 Regiment, with its new piece of kit, known as MLRS. MLRS stands for the Multiple Launch Rocket System. It's actually involved title, but um, for its American, uh, a bit like that. Uh, it is 
uh, a rocket launcher system which will fire in a single salvo total of 12 rockets. Uh, they're contained in uh, pods, uh, rocket pods, which are basically packs of ammunition which can be loaded and offloaded uh, from the launcher uh, very simply. Uh, the rockets are fired in the space of about 45 seconds and will travel out to a distance uh, up to 32 kilometers. Zero five one. Five zero zero. Store. Three eight three. Certainly it was uh, an enormous act of faith in not only uh, the soldiers that they will be ready in time, but also in the equipment, uh, brand new equipment, relatively unproven, and certainly it had never been used uh, in war. So uh, an, an enormous act of faith. Arm rockets. Fire. To the Iraqis at the receiving end of this unholy barrage, that act of faith came to be known as Black Rain, because each rocket contained 644 anti-personnel bombs, which would shower them with hot metal splinters. Meanwhile, the more conventional artillery batteries were practicing what's known as steam gunnery. To their colleagues, they're known as the Mop and Bucket Brigade. These guns can throw high explosive shells over 15 miles. But the question was, what effect was the artillery barrage having? Uh, it, it's a very important problem, this, because it, upon the battle damage assessment depends the commander's decision as to whether he's going to make the next move. And, for example, in, in the case of the uh, war we're talking about, whether or not the land, when the land forces were going to be let off the leash and allowed to go forward. On February 24th, the ground forces began their advance. Aided by image intensifiers, which can turn night into something approaching day, they kept going long after sunset. 4,000 miles away in Surrey, their progress was being closely studied. In the west here, the, Br the British have breached through the defensive line and what I want to, us to do now is to discuss the move for the next day, throughout the night, and the options which the Iraqis have. On the end the From the first day of the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, military analysts in the UK and the United States had been playing top secret war games, asking the question, what if? What if it rained? Which it did. What if the Iraqis used chemical weapons? Which they didn't. So, on the... On the Allied side, 3 ACR, 2 ACR will move up in this direction, as they did in the last game. But the new thing for this game, and the one which we would compare it with, are these two units here, I presume, Charlie. Yes. Going to bring those down. Yes. Night and day, the war game computers were programmed with the very latest classified information from the front line. Armed with their own arsenal of facts and figures, relating to everything from the rate of fire of an MLRS to the range of a tornado, these computers are invited to imagine a host of different game plans, including estimates of how many people got killed. Matt, have you computed uh, the, the actual combat loss rate? But as the analysts here readily acknowledge, the conclusions their computers come to are determined by the information they've been given. But as General Sir Peter de la Bilia points out, reality isn't always quite so cut and dry so they can continue to fight. And these computer uh, feedouts that we then had were obviously things that we, uh, information that we looked at very carefully and considered. But let's be quite clear, computers don't run wars, human beings run wars, and you must be very careful to make sure that the information you get from computers is no more than just another piece of information. At the end of the day, you, the commander, have got to take the decisions and make judgments based on a wide range of information, including that provided by computers. Spy Tech will continue on Discovery Showcase. Coming up next, it's Shepard Nazi Uncovered, only on Discovery Journal. Hi. Hi. Uh, was it something I said? Just a business trip. I, uh, came over last night. I had company. You mean my brother? 
He just loves my coffee. Your brother. Savor the sophisticated taste of Taster's Choice. Hi. Don't tell me you forgot to pack your Taster's Choice. Listen, I'm gonna be in Paris. How romantic. Well, it can be. Pain like this could mean you have sensitive teeth. Here's a remarkable solution. Introducing Aquafresh Sensitive. It targets the cause of the pain. Microscopic holes that let hot and cold shoot straight to the nerve. Aquafresh Sensitive soothes the nerve and helps stop the pain. And with fluoride and that great Aquafresh taste, it can replace your everyday toothpaste. So you may never have sensitive teeth pain again. New Aquafresh Sensitive. Soothes the nerve. Helps stop the pain. There's no cleaner clean than Prell. And now the original cleaner Prell Green is back. Work, work. Clean, clean. There's no cleaner clean. Prell Clean. Ford trucks, the best, never best. You're right. Ford does build in toughness. But we also build in things that help you drive safely. Four-wheel anti-lock brakes are standard on Explorer and Bronco. Built-in child seats are available on Aerostar, and both Aerostar and Club Wagon offer driver-side airbags. Ford builds tough trucks, but we also build long-term relationships. The best-built, best-selling American trucks are built Ford tough. Among the lions, the jackals, and the other wild animals lives a creature which defies description. It can stand on its hind legs like a human. It's not afraid of scorpions or poisonous snakes. It's not a dog. It's not a cat. It's a meerkat. And it's really quite small. Join these filmmakers as they return to Meerkat Valley. Sunday at 9 Eastern and Pacific, only on Discovery Sunday. There's great family fun in the new fallen snow. And a special feeling you will come to know. And there's Ski Brule's 3150 Special, a day of Upper Michigan's best skiing and a night of Brule Village Lodging, just 3150. Call Ski Brule for reservations. More of what you ski for. Ski Brule. More of what you ski for. Ski Brule. Pick four people, any four. Say, your sister, your boss, your best friend, your neighbor. Chances are they're as bored with TV watching as you were before you got your home entertainment system from SoundWorld. If you don't share with them where they can go to experience a new kind of picture and sound that will enhance every fiber of their senses and add movie theater excitement to every minute they watch TV, well, let's just say they could get a little emotional. Tell them to go to SoundWorld, and then everyone will be satisfied. SoundWorld, because it's a whole new era in home entertainment. Spy Tech now continues on Discovery Showcase. By the middle of the second day of the ground war, all the sources of information were saying, move further, go faster. Time scales were compressed and lines of supply were stretched to breaking point. This is the military equivalent of a pit stop. But in Iraq, unlike Silverstone or Brands Hatch, the problem was where are the pits? It isn't easy finding a resupply dump that is quite literally in the middle of nowhere. The key to finding your way around in the desert lies in the fact that the heavens are crisscrossed with a system of exceptionally accurate clocks, more commonly known as navigation satellites. You've got to imagine from the point of view of my job, you're in a vehicle like this bumping up and down, um, you've got the um, flat featureless terrain, you've got headsets on, in one ear you've got your infantry commander speaking to you, in the other ear you've got your artillery commander speaking to you. It's very hard to do all that and map read as well. You can imagine by just switching on a button um, on this machine on the trim pack, you know exactly where you are. It makes life a lot easier. You have your window which tells you where you um, exactly are and a control system there. You can use it to navigate um, between any two points or you can use it just to find your position. The only trouble was very occasionally, it's sort of about half an hour morning, half an hour in the evening, uh, the satellites would obviously get into a sort of bad uh, orientation and we'd get the dreaded display saying GPS bad. 
the gloom all around because it meant that uh, it wasn't going to tell you where you were. It wasn't going to help you at all. So uh, the show tended to grind to a halt during these, these periods. By February 26, the show was within two days of grinding to a halt for keeps. But it wasn't quite over yet. The Iraqis were beginning to pull out of Kuwait, and it was decided that they should be stopped before they could either regroup or escape. Over the following 24 hours, those orders were executed with ruthless efficiency. This is the view through an Apache helicopter gun sight. Appropriately, the laser-guided missiles which are causing this slaughter are called Hellfire missiles. Hovering undetected two kilometers or so from the target, just above the ground, the Apaches can simply pick off their victims for as long as they have missiles left to fire. The mother of all retreats was halted here on what came to be known after the ceasefire as the road of death. As an oddly surreal counterpoint to the carnage of the Basra Road, a 10-foot-long unmanned radio-controlled aeroplane was also about to enter the history books. It's basically a flying TV camera designed to watch where the USS Wisconsin's massive 16-inch shells land. In the confusion of the ceasefire, however, it was spotted by a platoon of Iraqi infantry who promptly surrendered to it. Elsewhere, Iraqi troops were surrendering in a more conventional fashion, hoping, as one army major briskly pointed out earlier in this program, that they would be among those spared. We will spare three types of people, mullahs, medical orderlies, and people who have clearly indicated their wish to surrender. Uh, anybody else will be killed. It had been only two weeks ago that John Potter had uttered those chilling textbook sentiments. But since then, he'd experienced the fear and fatigue of war. It, uh, it all seems to have happened in a very, very short space of time. Uh, I, I was amazed at, at just the pace, how intense the operation was, how fast it was, and how many positions we, we rode through. The, the speed of, of, that we could move the armor, that we could move the warrior, using the night sights, using the TI, and using the satellite navigation and then engaging the positions and the total isolation and the silence it's so quiet inside the vehicle because of the soundproofing it's not like being out on the ground get outside the vehicle and sure all hell is breaking loose but inside the vehicle you're cocooned from it and and there's almost a a false sense to it it's, it's like a computer game looking through the sights the, the night sights the the lack of color the false color of the objective picking up the muzzle flashes, feeling strike of, of 7.62 small arms against the vehicle and being totally immune and being able to swing around and pick out bunkers at, at 800 meters away by pumping a couple of HE into them until they stop firing back. Everyone has now stopped firing back and Iraqi forces no longer occupy Kuwait. That was, after all, the point. But what else did the Gulf War achieve? What lessons were learned? What messages did the Americans send to the world by conducting this war in the way they did? What messages did we, the voting public, pick up? For 44 days, TV audiences in the West had hungrily consumed the pictorial diet of precision bombing, stealth fighters, cruise missiles, and patriots. We have the technology, the images implied, to win any war, anywhere, against anyone, quickly, precisely, cleanly. But what we rarely saw was what the weapons used in our name and on our behalf actually do to people. Our soldiers did, though. Although they don't know who this man was, his body is about to become one of the many thousand unnamed corpses 
buried 15 feet beneath the desert sands of his homeland. As an Iraqi conscript, he didn't ask to go to war. He didn't expect to die, and probably neither saw nor heard what killed him. In time, when he fails to return home, his family will come to accept that their worst fears are indeed true. And what lessons might Saddam Hussein draw from the spectacle of a team from the British Army burying an Iraqi soldier they can't identify, and then marking his grave with a satellite navigation instrument. Saddam took on the technological might of the most powerful armies in the world and survived, but only just. Next time, it may be simpler and more effective to take on the West civilian populations instead, threatening them with indiscriminate low-tech weapons of mass destruction and terror. Delving into secret KGB files, filmmakers uncover dark secrets and frightening facts as they examine the power struggle within the former Soviet Union. Don't miss Shevardnadze Uncovered, next on Discovery Journal.